Hi, this is Bruce from Groxio, and we've got Maggie behind the camera. We've got the dog on the floor. This is the fourth and final chapter for the prologue language, and prologue is the first language in our Joe Armstrong celebration. We hope you're having fun so far. So why do so many colleges and universities teach so much prologue? It's not because the graduates are going to run home and use it in their day-to-day -day jobs. It's because the concepts are so critical. And we thought that we'd walk through some of those ideas and look at how you might apply them in your greater career. The first concept that we're going to talk about is that languages borrow from one another. Just like every spoken language that you learn accelerates the next, each programming language that you learn accelerates the next. And this is especially true among languages of the same family. The fundamental differences between Erlang and Prolog are so different that you might not have expected similarities between the languages to survive. But nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, look at these simple programs side by side. Superficially, you can see that there are a lot of syntax similarities. For example, the comments are the same. The punctuation between them is the same. Terminators are the same. Even if you go beyond the superficial, you have multiple function heads that communicate the same function and the same concept. And even if you dive into those individual function heads, you can see the pattern matching. These things in both languages match in an empty list. These pieces of syntax match the first element of a list and the rest of the list. And even if you can dive down into those pattern matches themselves and the deconstruction, you can see that these are ignored arguments. And if you don't specify that underscore, the compiler will warn both users of Erlang and Prolog against singleton variables. And you can see that even the structure of the programs is the same. These both use an imperative programming style that's marked with the heavy use of recursion for low-level concepts. So if you want to learn functional programming, you can learn some of the languages that are imperative, like Prolog, and they're an excellent way to start learning your functional programming. Number two, Prolog represents a distinct way of thinking. In fact, instead of expressing a line of code, you express a logical fact, and you roll those logical facts up into rules, and those rules are used to express goals. In Prolog, you describe a solution rather than the steps that you need to get there. This is the first problem that Joe and I worked together. This is the map coloring problem. You can immediately see this idea of writing a program by describing the solution in this map coloring problem. We can take this coloring and it has Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And all we do is describe the map. We say that Alabama and Tennessee are bordering states, and Kentucky and Tennessee are bordering states. And a bordering state means that A is a color, B is a color, and A and B are different. And a color basically means that whatever state we're coloring is a member of this list. And after we describe that problem, Prolog has everything it needs to build the solution. This is one of my favorite problems from seven languages in seven weeks, solving a Sudoku problem. Here's another beautiful example of Prolog, the Sudoku problem. And you can see, once again, all we're going to do is describe the solution. So the solution of a Sudoku is that our 4x4 four four board has four different rows right here. And then we flatten the rows and we say everything in that flattened list of rows is a number from one to four, exactly as it should be. And then all of the rows are different, all of the columns are different, and all of the squares are different, which is a wonderful solution to the problem. And everything else is displaying the board, which looks like this, and specifying what a square is. We specify the squares exactly like this. And that's it. Number three, Prolog's unification is a mind-blowing feature that not many other languages support. And in fact, this feature makes it easier to think about and reason about some of the most exciting problems in computer science today. Let's take a look at some programs that we wrote along the way and some of the ones that have a larger impact in terms of things that are happening right now in computer science. 
Of course, we started with this simple database of facts. These are people who tweet. These are individual tweets and how they represented a social network. And you can actually imagine facts like this that describe social media graphs. This is just graph theory and Prolog is very, very good at it because the edges in a graph can be represented very succinctly with a rule like this one. Jill tweets a greeting. Eric follows Jill. There's a treat called gossip. There's a tweet called Anna or a person who tweets. Now another type of data that we looked at was scheduling data. And this is an example of a schedule where we describe a team, we describe a match, we list all of the potential matches that our system can create, we describe a day, and then we make sure that games on the across the same day have different teams and we can even apply constraints. And let's look at what some of the constraints might look like. So we have a team called called the Munchkins and these the teams in this league are the otters, monkeys, parrots and penguins. And the days that they can play are May 2nd, May 9th, May 16th, May 23rd and so on. And so if I want to specify a constraint, here's what I do. I take a, a team and I say, this team can't play in the morning on May 16th. And then I might also have another couple of constraints. Let's say that the monkeys also can't play in the morning and the otters oh and the parrots can't play in the afternoon and then after I lay in these constraints Prolog can honor these they're just one more fact as it goes through its schedule building and another type of, of program that we'll see frequently is a logic constraint program and this program, what we have is, is what's called the eight queens problem. And the eight queens problem can be described like this. It's played on a chessboard that is eight rows long. Every queen on the, ch on the chessboard is going to be on location one to eight. And all of those queens have to be on different columns. And, all, and none of the queens should be able to tack each other. That is, they should be, none should be in the same row, column, or diagonal. And the rest of the program is describing what safe means, that they're on different diagonals and so on and so forth. So it's a very short program to describe a very difficult logic constraint strength problem. And it turns out that Prolog is often used as a logic constraint language for things like schedules, for things like um, programming a route or things like that. And in fact, one of the ways that you can use a, um, a graph is with weights. So for example, I might have these edges and each edge has a weight. So maybe this weight is something that's positive, like the amount of money that I can have, that I can make by going from A to C. And maybe it's negative, like the amount of gas that I might use by driving from B to C. But whichever, whichever solution that you have, one of the things that we can do is find all of, the, um, all of the possible solutions. And then from those possible solutions, find the minimum path or the one with the minimum weight, which is what we're doing here. So I'm not suggesting that everybody in Programmer Passport is going to rush home and write Prolog for a living. But I do think that Prolog solutions can inform you in a day and age where graphs, machine learning, and maps are all becoming much, much more interesting in the programming fields. And a little bit of exposure to these ideas and the tools that you can bring to bear can't be a bad thing. Think about it. Machine learning, scheduling, 
mapping, social networks, and analysis, all of these things are exploding in significance right now. And Prolog is an ideal solution for all of them. So that's why I'm so excited about Prolog and I'm so excited to have shared it with you. It was one of Joe's favorites and I think that you can see why. In fact, Prolog was created in 1970 so you can get a bit of the flavor that Prolog was ahead of his time. Sort of like a lot of other languages like Lisp or even Joe Armstrong's Erlang. And that leads us to the next language in the list, one that was inspired by Erlang. We're going to be walking through Elixir and we sure do hope you'll join us.